Ukulele Tales, the ukulele podcast with John Atkins. Hello and welcome back to Ukulele Tales. Don't you find that Wednesdays just seems to be rolling around quicker and quicker each week at the moment? February already, good grief. Seems like only a week or two ago we were all excited for Christmas. And now we are hurtling through 2023 like an unstoppable comet. Have you had a good week? I'm okay, thanks. Lots of positive feedback from the Christopher Davis Shannon episode last week. And it's really cool that as people are still discovering the Ukulele Tales podcast, a lot of you are going back and downloading some of the older episodes too. If you are listening for the first time, welcome. It's really, really good to have you. And although Ukulele Tales has only been going for three or four months, we already have some terrific episodes in the archives. I'd like to recommend a few for you right now. Episode one with James Hill was, of course, a classic and still the most downloaded episode to date. James is such a passionate and knowledgeable speaker that we probably could have spoken all day if he hadn't had a workshop to go to and uh, and teach. And I'm sure you all know who he is, so I won't bore you with his potted bio. But suffice to say that it's not your run-of-the-mill average interview, and I think we cover a lot of fun new ground. So go and check that one out if you haven't already heard it. And on the topic of James, I'd like to say a big hello to any fellow UK heads who might be listening to this one. Uh, another favourite episode of mine is episode number nine with Bagiti Kumalo. Now that might not be the most familiar household name, even in the ukulele world, but it's an episode you don't want to sleep on. Bagiti is Paul Simon's long-serving bass guitar player. He joined Paul Simon on the album Graceland over 35 years ago. And barring a couple of breaks, he's played with him on and off ever since. Now, I wouldn't claim to be a journalist, but if I was, this would be my Pulitzer episode. I went into it armed with a bunch of questions about the bass solo from You Can Call Me Al, what it's like to work with Paul Simon. But I ended up with an incredible biography of someone who has just had the most fascinating life story. Bagiti talks about how he grew up in poverty back in South Africa, unable even to attend school as it was being used as a military base. With no formal education, music was Bagiti's only hope for a better life, and he's still thankful today for all the incredible opportunities that it has afforded him. It really is the most wonderful story, and one I recommend everyone check out if you get the chance, because as well as speaking about all of this interesting, fascinating stuff, uh, I do, of course, chat with him about music, working with Paul Simon, Gloria Estefan, and many other top names. And he's a humble, articulate, and fascinating guy, and one, again, I would love to have spent another couple of hours just chatting away with. And, of course, there's lots more great episodes to check out. So I really think just have a look through the archives, scroll back, and I'm sure you'll find some people that you're interested in. Heck, Jake Shimabukuru was the Christmas special episode for crying out loud. Not bad for a podcast that's only been going since November. So welcome, welcome, and welcome once again if you're new here, and welcome especially if you're a regular listener, and Ukulele Tales makes up a regular part of your week's routine. We really need a name for you guys, don't we? Friends of the Show is about the best I can come up with, but I'm sure you guys can think of a good nickname for yourself. Tail Chums, Buddies, Compatriots... Uh, I don't know, nothing sounds quite right to me. But if you can think of some fun names, then drop me a message at any of the usual outlets. I'm easy to find on Patreon, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook is a really good way to reach me right now, too. And of course, you can always email me. My address is uketeacher at grabyouryuke.com. I always love receiving emails, and I'm always happy to read them out on the show, too, with your permission, of course. So if there's anything you want to say to me, go ahead and drop me a line and I always do my best to get back to everyone. Okay, let's get on to today's guest. I first saw Andrew Molina play at the Austrian Ukulele Festival back in 2019, and I was blown away by his virtuosity. Performing on stage with his bass-playing father, Andrew absolutely stole the show with his inventive arrangements of popular songs, as well as his technical expertise. Well, it goes without saying what an incredible musician Andrew is, and of course, we cover all of that. He started playing the ukulele at the age of 13, and lists among his influences as Brittany Piver, 
who was also a guest on the show just a couple of weeks ago. We talk about all sorts in this interview, including the pros and cons of playing and touring with his own dad, and what it was like learning music in Hawaii, live streaming during the pandemic, and performing and teaching in workshops. We even touch a little on our shared love of MMA and professional wrestling in the second half of the interview. Andrew was a really awesome, personable guy to chat to, and he's just opened up the brand new Andrew Molina Ukulele Academy, his online teaching school. So, of course, we talk a bit about that as well. And I recommend it's something that you guys check out if you're really looking for an advanced, experienced and dedicated ukulele teacher. There's a lot to cover in this one, so we'll jump right into it. And we start off, just for a change, by me being baffled or confused about US geography and my consternation at just how far Hawaii is from the US mainland. Recorded during the Los Angeles International Ukulele Festival, this is me and Andrew Molina. I remember I was doing like a massive sort of tour, or not not like a music tour, but just a kind of... Um, you know, road trip, I guess, of the USA about six or seven years ago. Mm. And I was like, oh, I've got to get to Hawaii. I've got to get to Hawaii. I'm staying in LA for a week. Of course, I'll, I'll spend a few days in Hawaii. And I didn't realize it's like another sort of, you know, six hours there and six hours back. And right, right. It's kind of like going to the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, so I, ha- I still haven't been anyway, is the point I was going to make. Oh. But, uh, but you're from there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was pretty much born and raised in, in Hawaii. I was born on Oahu, but, you know, we moved to Maui. Two weeks later, so I've always been my home. My dad has been there in his entire life. And it's nice, it's relaxing. It's a little bit more uh, laid back than like Honolulu or Oahu. It's more urban and um, yeah, just, it was, it's, it's been awesome living there, but it can get a little small, that's why. Really, yeah. Especially during the pandemic. What's the sort of rough population of your island? Oh, maybe a couple hundred thousand. Okay. And Oahu yeah. is definitely like about over a million. Yeah. Yeah. Oh really? Wow. Okay, that's sort of bigger than I thought in some ways. Like a million. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I, yeah. I want to say it's a, it's very uh, populated on Oahu, and Maui is um, more rural and suburban areas. Yeah. So even though it doesn't even though it doesn't seem like it, Oahu is actually smaller than Maui, which right. Yeah. Yeah. Surprise people sometimes. And you grew up there, right? Yeah. 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 yeah so yeah. I grew up in Maui, and I, you know, of course, I go back and forth with Oahu because my grandparents were there, so. You know, when I was like five years old, we go back and forth, and then they finally moved to Maui to see me grow up. And yeah, it's uh, it's, it's it's pretty awesome growing up in Hawaii. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, I've got I have to say I'm a bit ignorant of the geography, I guess. But how easy is it to get between the sort of islands? Like how? Um, it's about maybe like a twenty minute plane ride. Plane ride. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. There's no bridge. Yeah. Right. No, no. <laughs> no. I thought you might like sail or something. Um, there yeah. used to be something called the super ferry, okay. which was like this is when I was back, like. 2008 but then they stopped people didn't really care for it however it did have a good function of you know taking your vehicle over if you had to work for oh, the yeah, weekend right. or something yeah. like that but then they stopped out a while back so now literally you either catch like a you could say a cruise ship if you're going to do that or just flying is the easiest yeah yeah now we, we've just done a school uh, like assembly today we were just talking yeah, at, a, yeah. at a school locally and um one of the things that you said because you you're from hawaii as we've just spoke about so I figured kind of, oh, you'd have had like the best music teachers and no. it would be like a part of your blood. And you were saying you basically learned the ukulele by listening to CDs. Is <laughs> yeah, that right? Yes. Or, yeah. 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 So pretty much, um, you, well, I mean, at the very beginning, you know, my cousin and my, one of my friends would come over every Friday teaching me just some strumming. And a lot, a lot of people know this, but in Hawaii, it's like, you know, there's not a lot of music theory taught. I mean, if you go to like the Roy Sukumo, yes. But it's usually, it's usually, okay, see this, put your fingers right there. Really hands-on, right. kind of Kapila style. And then we'll be like, what is that? I'm like, oh, just press that. Just press that right there. And it'll be like your A chord or something yeah. like that. So, I mean, other than that, I, then my dad asked me the question one day. Do you know who Jake Shimabukuro is? And this is back in 2000. And Jake. Jake. Yeah. 2005. Yeah. So this is, be- this is before the Jen Lee Weeps video and oh, all wow. that. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, and I thought it was just like an old Japanese guy from Japan, you know, like 80 years old, played in a chair. I didn't know it was this young 27 year old kid. Yeah. Right. And um, my dad bought me tickets to go see him. 
because he was coming to Maui. How did what, your dad know about him then? Ah, uh, he's you know? like, oh, I'm kidding. You know what? He was playing. Um, my dad was playing at the hotel one day, and and then Jake was actually the opening act. Oh, amazing! And yeah, and he goes, yeah, this kid, all these pedals and everything. I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't yeah. really know what to expect, and you know, my dad bought. Um, I think it was he bought me the DVD and his like all like all four of his CDs at the time for me from for Christmas, and I just remember I would just devour them just one after another and i was like okay i'm gonna try to learn this and you know like having to play the song over and over on the cd player was uh was tough and right. i mean we had yeah. itunes and stuff like that but yeah. even my grandma will tell you yeah you used to sit in front of the computer for hours just trying to figure out like three chords yeah because <laughs> yeah. you know there was no reference and we don't know what it sounded like but yeah after i heard jake it was just like it was kind of like a switch and i told myself you know i, I want to do that when i grow up and have you played with him now? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I've, I've, you know, he's he's featured on my my second album, uh, New Journey, and um, I have performed with him a couple times, and we did a YouTube video together last year. So he's actually a really good friend of mine, mentor. Oh, great! But, great. but growing up, he was my idol. You know, yeah. like I wanted, like he was, and he kind of helped me get out of my shell because you know, growing up, I was super shy. Yeah, I could never stand in front of an auditorium and do what I did today. Right, and right. Then now that's what gives me the most joy, which is pretty ironic. Yeah, from a, from a kid who was afraid to do book reports in front of your your class, and to now it's just like that's what I want to do for a living is you know help inspire and help kids, help just even anyone with goals in their life to be able, just get better. You well, know. you've just opened, is it like a, an academy or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so I got, the, I, got, I got my academy out and I have some, I got some big news for next year coming out, which is kind of like an expansion, but I think people, I think people would dig the, the new, new program as well. Amazing. So, so what exactly? What form does the academy take? Is it like online lessons, or are so you doing stuff in person? Or? Yeah. So it's a right now. It's like it's like a set of pre-recorded videos, um, ranging from beginners to I want to say super super advanced, but it'll get you the um, essential levels. What you um, you know, picking, strumming, and stuff like that. And I, it was just a way for me to help educate. Um, if I'm on tour or something like that, but I've kind of really fallen in love with the teaching as well. So I teach when I'm back home and when I'm on the road, I get to perform. So I get the best of both worlds. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you prefer? You prefer pref uh, performing on stage, would you say? I would say so. I yeah. would say so. Because that, that was my first love is performing. Right. And it was, I only started for teaching from the pandemic, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So before yeah. that, and, and I think before like, I, I lacked the, the theory to teach, right? So I would really, I would, you know, workshops were really tough for me. But now after putting the time in, I was like, oh, this is, this is not too bad. Yeah. So it's become really fulfilling for me as, as a teacher and seeing my, my students grow. And so, yeah, like at home, you know, wake up, teach, and then take a break and then do something. And then, you know, sometimes we'd have a gig that night. So get a little bit of both. Are you doing workshops this weekend at the LA I'm actually Festival? not. You're I, not. I think no. me and Brittany are doing like a Q&A session. Okay. So yeah. Like a masterclass kind of thing. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You can say something yeah. like that. But I, I enjoy those too. Those are, you know, very open-ended and um, really direct to the people who have specific questions. Yeah. So yeah. those are lots of fun. So going back to a couple of minutes ago, um, I asked you how your dad knew about Jake, and you said, "Well, he was playing." Yeah, yeah. And now the the funny thing is, I think of your dad as like your uh, support guy, like your kind of bass player, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which he is. Yeah. But I guess he was a musician before that, right? Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. He's been playing music since I think I want to say when he was thirteen, something like that. And actually, to go even further, my grandpa and his eight brothers. We were in a big band called the Molina Orchestra back oh, okay. in the nineteen like forties and fifties and stuff like that. So that were, they were like a big deal on Maui, and um, they played like a little big like big band jazz and yeah. stuff like that. So my my grandpa was like, okay, you're gonna you're gonna start playing bass. Is any of that on YouTube? You think? I I you know I'm not sure. I doubt it. Man, I'd <laughs> but love to we see might it. have some old videos somewhere because <laughs> yeah. it's it's very fascinating. So it kind I kind of feel like a little weight on my shoulders to continue the legacy. Yeah. I'm the third generation. And um, yeah, but the difference was, you know, um, my dad never pushed it on me like how his dad pushed it on him. But my dad's been a lifelong musician, you know, right out of high school, he moved to Oahu and was doing a lot of the music scene there and it's never, and that's what he's been doing. And on Maui, he was doing like the, the shows at the Luau. And what was he doing? Just playing bass with a band, or was he a solo guy as well? Bass, no, bass. just mainly a bass support. But his his true love is like jazz and some of the more modern stuff like that. But um, yeah, he only started playing guitar because we needed some rhythm. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's a bass man for sure. Yeah. 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 
and now he's kind of like your uh, chaperone, I guess. Or, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. He, like he works a lot back home. Does he? Okay. So um, I'm glad that he got to come out this time because he picks up a lot of gigs, and you know, I don't want to pull him from what he does back home. But yeah, it's good to be able to travel with him, and uh, we do our thing and stuff like that. Yeah. But the support from him is always uh, is always the best. Yeah. 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 Um, I met you in uh, Austria first, yeah. in I think 2018, was it 17, uh, 18? I want to say the 19. Was it 19? Okay, 19, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, wow. Which is still like three or four years, yeah, three or four years ago. It feels now, like five because of the pandemic. I know, it feels longer, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And that was, uh, that was one of the first festivals I've done, apart from the LA one. Really? But yeah, honestly, yeah, I don't, I don't do them that often. Um, I get really nervous. <laughs> so, oh, really? Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't really, uh, I don't really enjoy doing them. Oh, you know, that's I mean, so funny because yeah. like, we have different styles of her, like, because you're really comfortable in front of a camera. Yeah. Right? I, me, I'm more comfortable in front of people. Right, okay. When it's, like, lights and stuff, like, especially, like, during, I don't know if you remember the period, well, I know for sure you remember the period of the pandemic when live streaming was yeah. a thing. Oh, my gosh, man. Like, I remember my, we'd do these live stream shows and my dad like, okay, 10 o'clock and I'd just be sweating, you know, there's all these bright lights and then when you, you know, you're playing this song with no energy, so I just remember I would dread those things, man. It was, it was yeah. uh, but it's a different, it, that's why it's so interesting talking to someone who's, is, who does more of the opposite in front of the, the camera versus, because um, you said, but you, you don't perform too much, you said in front Yeah, of the well, not ukulele stuff, but I'm not awkward in front of a crowd, like I love, um, I actually used to do, uh, you know, wrestling, right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I used to be like an MC. Oh, so I would really? Be, yeah, I'd be like in the middle of the ring. And the same with like cage fighting, like MMA as well. No way. Yeah, so I'd be sort of like in the red corner weighing 220 pounds <laughs> and like announcing all this stuff. So like, I'm not scared of being in front of a crowd. Yeah. I just, I think I don't have the confidence as a musician oh, to be doing I it see. in like a festival where there's all these kind of like, like yourself, like amazing professional musicians and I'm sort of like, oh, here's how you play C, here's how you play F. Yeah. And I just feel like a little bit of a, a phony, you know. So, uh, yeah, so the, the festivals, they get me in the, the cold sweat, like, like you were saying, uh, yeah. the live streams did. Yeah, it's, but, it, uh, it's a good practice, though. It's, yeah. it's you know, yeah. like, you got some practice today. I'm getting some <laughs> yeah. today. I'm getting some, yeah, some more tomorrow, I guess, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just, you know, like, like I said, it's just like it's just two opposite um, styles, but it's, it's good to know both. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Dude, that, done, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna say that's cool that you used to do announcing. Oh right, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I'm big into like MMA and stuff. I, you know, I do jujitsu, so oh, I'm you? a huge okay. fan of like yeah. UFC and all that stuff. So yeah. I thought I think that's pretty cool. Oh, amazing! No, I, yeah, that was like my well before I became the ukulele teacher. That was my thing before that. Oh, the, so uh, yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah. Um. So you've done like a bunch of festivals, right? Though, like all over. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've done Austria, obviously. We've done Ganoff in the UK. Um, been to Tahiti. Been to China, of course. Yeah, you were saying about China at the school, you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. Was so that sort of difficult to go to? I mean, isn't there a lot of, like, visa restrictions and things? Or uh, Yeah, you have to get, like, a work visa and stuff, but it was pretty much like a giant NAM. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we, we did the show, same crazy, even bigger than them so it's even more crazy but pretty much same thing you know play at the booth and stuff like that yeah. eat some real authentic chinese food which is actually very very clean compared to some of the stuff we have like in america you know i was very i was very surprised and i was like oh wow this is you know and maybe it was just a type of food from the um shanghai region or something like that but it was it was very good yeah yeah so how young were you when you started playing the ukulele? Was it 10 or something, did you say? Or? Uh, just, I think I just turned 13. Just turned 13, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. And, and yeah, yeah, so actually when thinking of it, that was a quick transition. Within the span of six months, I was already learning Jenny Weeps. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Right, so, and then you must have started like performing pretty young. You, you, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. My dad would actually, they would do this thing at the shopping center. And I remember I was, I, I was almost 14. So within about a year of training, I played in front of like 800 people. Yeah, that's like unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So I got my taste because, and then I, you know, I would watch Jake and I'd be like, okay, if he can do it, maybe I can do it too. But I, it was just, it, and it's different playing in front of people. It's ner the nerves pop in. So that's something you can't really prepare for unless you do like open mics or something like that. But yeah, I played, a, I played a little bit when I was a kid um, or teenager. And, um, but then other than that, it was maybe like a couple of talent shows. But another, and then um, after that was, you know, pretty much just going to school. And then, then 
I came out with my CD maybe a year or two after I graduated. From uh, so was that like 19 school. or something? How, how old were you yeah, been must have been like, yeah. So I would do those like once in a while gigs when I was a kid, play one yeah. song, you know, my dad would give me like 20 bucks. Oh yeah. And then I'd be like, oh, and I'd, and I'd be all stoked. And then I started really pursuing this 2013, I want to say. And then, you know, I was playing for free under the band entry for tips on Maui. Yeah. And that was where the real humble beginnings. But yeah, it was after that, I was like, okay, let me, I want to try to work up to restaurants. But my real the thing I really wanted to do was travel and play. That's what, that was my big, big dream. So everything that's happened has been part of a, a, a vision, you know, nothing yeah. happened by accident. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, that's, that's cool to hear. Bikiti was kind of saying the same thing. Not that it wasn't, oh, how do I put this? Well, I don't need to tell his story. Basically, like he was always focused on like his goals. Like he wanted to yeah. leave um, South Africa, he wanted to go to the USA. He wanted to do this and that. And he kind of, whenever he was playing, that was always in the back of his mind. He was sort of visualizing yeah. that stuff. And I guess you kind of got to see Yeah, no, the visualizing is everything. So that's when I tell my students, I'm like, before I teach you, I want you to know what you want to do and where you want to go. Because then it's easy. It's easier, I think, for a student to learn if they know what they want. Yeah. Versus just like, oh, I want to learn music theory. Or but like, what part of music theory? Right. Do you want to learn how to read? Do you want to learn how to do your chord vocabulary increase or you know do you want to know how to i don't know you know like um change keys so you have to be very specific in your learning and how, makes... how much of this stuff do you know like do you can you read music i know uh, no okay i was gonna say <laughs> i play a lot by ear i found that with a lot of the people i've interviewed for this like a lot of people are sort of like oh yeah i don't read music but yeah like you said you play it by ear and, or... and i come from a very i would say a street style learning okay or and that's kind of the way i teach too you know i don't get too much into the book the book work kind of like flusters me a little bit so yeah. i teach like concepts and more practical stuff like okay instead of obsessing over whole whole half for example three to four half step seven eight half step you know i'll simplify it to us <laughs> very much so anyone can understand it and i and i put a huge emphasis on shapes because that's something we all know as kids you know we're not all good at math i'm i, I was horrible at math right. so some of that stuff like flusters me once in a while so i take what i need for me it was more of like a I want, I want to learn the functions of minor seven chords and all that. I want to increase my vocabulary so when I'm jamming with you guys, I can compliment you with right. these nice, beautiful voicing chords and songwriting. So that's what I want out of it, yeah. is being able to write songs and have the vocabulary necessary to do stuff like that. So tell me a bit about your songwriting, actually, because your albums are a mix of covers and your own yeah. work, right? Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah. I was always you know, very interested in the variety of the ukulele and what you can do. So for me, I'm always messing, you know, with uh, different tunings, the high and low G, yeah. I get carry two ukes. And when it comes to original stuff, I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll come across like um, an idea or like, um, maybe I'll, I'll be, st I stumble upon it. You know, I'll be just noodling in my backyard. I'm like, oh, okay, what chord is that? E minor, okay, let's find the chords around E minor, D, C, B7 maybe. And then I'll kind of build on there. And, but my, my writing has definitely evolved and now I'm starting to mess with keys that um, new keys because I don't always want to play in C, A minor, G. So, you know, I'm starting to write in E now because I know that it's kind of avoided. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not an easy key for the ukulele though. No, no, no. no but it is no. the main guitar key, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I forced myself, I'm like, okay, I'm going to investigate these other keys and take or and just appreciate what's unique with them because there's cer certain voicings you can get in E that you can't get in C. Yeah. Also with D and some of the other stuff. So, so do you play a guitar as well? At no. all? Not at all? No, man. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I try to mess around, you know, with some of the Daniel Ho tuning and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's just for fun. Because I was going to say, I was listening to your, I think it's your newest album mm -hmm. um, on uh, uh, Apple Music yeah, uh, yeah. early. And I love the Little Wing. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. like one of, I mean, Hendrix is like one of my favorites. And that is my favorite of his songs yeah he, is he like a, a sort of an influence on you even though you're a ukulele player is yeah it's funny i don't really take influence from ukulele players. right it's okay. all it's all either guitarists or like um yeah so like Jimi hendrix you know little wing that's one of my favorite songs yeah. too and just like john mayer obviously is one of my right. one of my heroes yeah you know got to see him in concert and yeah so like john mayer Jimi hendrix guys like that you know i watched their licks and i'm just like man 
and uh, yeah, I try to adapt. Even some of the acoustic way acoustic guitars play them, you know, messing with the low G a little bit, trying to get some of those interesting voicings. Yeah. But yeah, I would say those two up there. Of course, classic rock is one of my cl uh, favorites, you know, Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. stuck in the 80s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, I feel like I'm a little bit out of time as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. For sure. So uh, what other, like, um, covers have you done? Um, Let's see, I've done stuff like, uh, I've done a little bit of classical, Gymnopathy Number no. 1 by Eric Satie. It was a very nice uh, piano piece that I heard, and um, that's a cool piece. Let's see, of course, um, I mentioned Aerosmith, which would be like Dream On, Sweet Child of Mine for Guns N' Roses. Yeah, yeah. Hotel California, uh, Stairway to Heaven. All the, like, classics. All, all the, the classics, classics yeah. Much. How, how do you go about... Um arranging one of these pieces for the ukulele so they're different because some of them are different keys right we're yeah. just talking about that yeah sweet child of mine is easy c b flat f okay you know and then the melody is right you know you have like a you know you're, you're on the second string and it, it doesn't really leave there but you when you're messing with something like aerosmith and this is when i kind of stumbled and realized a song is in a key for a certain reason you know, if you if you um, kind of move it up to a different key, it just doesn't do it justice. Yeah. And yeah. Dream On has a very specific F minor flavor to it. And it just happens to be it works perfectly on ukulele with those open voicings and stuff like that. So that took about a month. That took about a month, especially trying to fit, you know, like Steven Tyler's vocals in there with the rhythm, with those weird chords that are in there, these long stretches. And... Um, yeah, so first I'll start with the melody, and then I, I'll have the chords, and then I'll turn it into a chord melody, where I can play it in a situation if I'm playing with a band or if I'm playing solo. Yeah. So I'll never arrange something that I can only play in one situation. I'll make sure it's adaptable in case, you know, my dad can't be it there on the road with right. me. Right, okay. So. Well, I was going to ask you that as well, actually. When you're playing with your dad, um, how much of it... Uh, how do I put this? Uh, how much of it have you kind of rehearse note for note how much of it do you have like kind of like a i guess i want to believe you have like a sort of telepathic bond between you and a lot of it is like by feel and and sort of uh extra kinetic whatever uh like mind stuff but um do you, do you kind of plan everything or, or do you have that sort of special bond between you it used to be like that obviously you know when i you know and i was new to you know and um new to just music and you know, branching out with my, I think it was my second CD. And I always used to get anxiety because, you know, I messed up a, a chord and he'd, like, like, he'd be rough. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time you were playing at NAMI, he goes, did you think that was good? And I was like, oh. And then so after that comment, I remember just being very afraid of what he would say. So like, you know, of course you get to that hard part of the song and I'd get anxiety. Yeah. And then I'd mess up because I, was, I wasn't confident. Yeah, Because right. I'd always be worried. So that's yeah. when I kind of switched my mindset to, you know, I'm just going to go for it. I don't care what he's going to say. I'm just, and then I'm going to do my best. And after that shift in mindset, I started messing up less. Yeah. 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 So, but now it's just, yeah, now I think I've just, um, we both got to the level where, you know, if, if we just look at each other. <laughs> that's what I mean, thing. right? Like musicians sort of have that, don't they? So like this morning, for example, when you guys were playing one of your songs to the school, yeah, yeah. Did you just kind of look at him as though kind of like take over now? Because he did like a little bass solo, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I, I'm guessing that wasn't completely yeah. planned or anything. Well, well so, the, so in that song, we usually do a bass solo. It's usually like, okay, what part's coming up? And I think I did with Britney because I never played that song with her. Oh, yeah, at yeah. All. That was Sitch, the first time I Lillian played it with her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like she was just like kind of cueing the chords when we were playing. Like yeah. the kids probably didn't know. No, no, so, I'm sure not. Yeah. So, and then she's okay, C, B flat. And then, so that was the first time we played together um, oh, on yeah? stage. So that was a good warm up for tonight. I was going to say, because you've got a whole concert together tonight. Haven't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. So we're actually rehearsing three songs. So I guess depending on the song, it requires the rehearsal time. Yeah. So that, that you know, Lilo Stitch, that was pretty, it's pretty much on the easier side. So I was like, okay, let me jump over with you. Wow, the importance of visualization. Isn't that interesting? You know, one of the great things about chatting with all these awesome musicians is to pick up things you might never even think about when you're learning at home. I know it's so easy to get bogged down in technique or theory or whatever song you're trying to learn, but what teacher talks about visualization like that? You know, I wonder if that's something that I've done in my career, maybe albeit subconsciously. Um, 
Either way, it's something that I'm trying to do more proactively since speaking with Andrew a few months ago. In fact, I've been trying to visualise getting over my dislike of ukulele festivals and apply to play at a lot more this year and next. It's not that I dislike them, I should say. I always have an absolute blast when I'm there in person. But like I said to Andrew, I just find that I get incredibly stressed out in the days leading up to them. But this year, I am going to try and actively visualise successful festival appearances and try and enjoy them more. What about you guys? Is there anything that you're going to try and visualise? Maybe reaching a certain standard of playing or performing in front of a live audience for the first time, writing your own song? I always think of words like visualisation as being the language of athletes. But of course, there's no reason why it can't be uh, applied to musicians as well. Focused musicians. Very interesting stuff. Oh, and he can't even read music. How about that? Anyway, I'm really enjoying this chat with Andrew and the incredible people that I've had the chance to get to know a bit by doing all these interviews, and I hope you are as well. Ukulele Tales is a really important podcast for me, and if you're enjoying it too, I hope you might consider throwing just a few dollars my way on Patreon at patreon.com slash uketeacher. Uh, You can sign up for as long or as short a time as you like, but you'll get access to all kinds of great stuff, including early access to the podcast, the chance to ask questions to some of my future guests, and even bonus content with some of the interviews that go a little bit long, because I do like to talk. Uh, In fact, there's a bonus 10 minutes with James Hill, Tyler from 10 Thumbs Pro, and even Christopher Davis Shannon from last week's episode, up there to enjoy right now for all my Patreon supporters. In fact, the chat with Christopher talks a lot about professional wrestling, which is something that Andrew and I go back to in the second half of this interview. And I do get a little bit caught off guard as my two worlds collide when Andrew starts describing British ukulele star Mark Gallagher. And I realised listening back that I was getting confused with a British wrestler who had a short-lived stint in the WWE a few years ago called Jack Gallagher. So if you'll excuse me getting confused once again, let's get back to my chat with Andrew Molina. More than 10 years ago, probably. Yeah. So, yeah, because, like, wrestling was, like, my passion. That's cool. And, uh, Did you ever wrestle? No, no. I, well, maybe I had one match as a joke, I think. But, like, uh, not as, like, a serious sort of fight or anything. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's, like, a lot of it is, like, showmanship. Right, matches, right, right, you know, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I never wrestled. <laughs> ah, I see. And I've certainly never had, like, my own cage fight or whatever. But I have emceed, like, cage fighting and boxing as well. Um did quite a bit of boxing for a bit. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Dude. Yeah, I, I love... I'm kind of getting... An, I sort of gave it up when the YouTube thing took off. Yeah, I yeah. I sort of got out of that world a bit, but yeah. I'm getting a little bit itchy now to maybe... Yeah, we uh, might have to have you... For, you know who challenged me to a wrestling match? You know no. Mark Gallagher? Who, Mark Gallagher? <laughs> yeah, from the... Who's that? What? So he's from, he's from the UK. Yeah. He, wears, he always wears like a pinstripe hat and like a suit. Wait, the Can't, wrestler, you mean? No, he's a ukulele player. Oh, ukulele player, okay. Right, I was gonna, no, why, why did he challenge you to a fight? Well, no, because, I mean, like, you know, he plays ukulele. He goes, oh, maybe for enough we can do a celebrity a grappling match. <laughs> Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> so that would be so funny though, because I mean I don't yeah. I mean I do jujitsu, but we practice wrestling. So I was like I don't know maybe, but then <laughs> I haven't thought about it for like two years. But once you said you did that, I was like oh look at that, that's an ukulele thing we could put. Yeah, well who knows, man? <laughs> who knows? You know, bringing the ukulele and the world of extreme violence together. You know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. why not, right? Why, why not? not? Why yeah. not? People might like it. Yeah. Oh man, you were talking about um, uh, Britney. And her CD yeah. being in your school. Yeah, yeah. So Brittany's been, I remember, I think, and she just told me today she's been doing this, like, for 18, 18 years or something, like, professionally. Really? Well, and she's only young herself, right? I yeah, mean, I think she's turning 34 on Wednesday. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. But, yeah, she's, um, she was, one like, one of the very first girl ukulele players besides Taimani, of course, you know? Yeah. And um, I remember, yeah, seeing her growing up, and yeah, it's just cool to be peers with her now. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Are you guys are friends, right? Or? Uh, I mean, she's on Oahu, so we don't hang out a bunch, but whenever we do, it's always a good time. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, yeah, so we were talking about her pedals and stuff. Oh, right, right, right. But you don't 
do much like that, do you? Or do you use sort of effects and pedals? Yeah, yeah, I, I loop here and there and I throw my distortion on. I just didn't do it today. Okay. But I'll probably do it tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that'll be cool. That'll be cool. Um, and uh, what kind of... Uh, you were talking about the tunings earlier as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, sometimes I, I love the open B flat six tuning. So I tune everything just a, a full step down. And you'd be surprised that even just with that lower frequency of the ideas that it can bring. Yeah. Because I get, I got, I'm, I think I've been in GCA too, so long that I, I've gotten kind of bored with it. So it's like I've got to resort to other tunings or even uh, I did my version, you know, like Dad Gad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a ukulele, just minus two string. So right. I guess I'll be tuning. The Gad. The yeah, yeah. So what, it, so what I would do, I would tune my G and C a step down and the E and A two step down. Right, okay. Yeah, so that's that's one of my songs called um, The Scorpion. Are you in... Yes, I was going to ask you about that one, actually. What did I write about that? I had a note. Um, Show down with a scorpion. Show down with a scorpion. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've actually written that could be a guitar. Like, it sounds like a sort of Spanish guitar or yeah, something. Yeah, no, the, and yeah. the thing is, the map is completely different. I had no idea what, what, what the heck I was playing for chords because, you know, this is no longer a G, this is no longer an F, so it kind of went back to when I was young and just going by sound. So I wrote the song completely on sound, not knowing what chord I'm playing at all. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you um, write your stuff down? I mean, or is it when, you, like, because you've obviously written like dozens of these pieces of music. Yeah. Do you write them down? I mean, you said you can't write, or you can't read music. Yeah. So how do you write this stuff down? Do you just memorize it? Yeah, or? pretty much. Really? Okay. And then maybe I'll like, I'll put a clip or I'll, like, I'll take a video or a voice recording. And so I, I don't forget it. But yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't know how to put that on. I mean, I guess I could write it off if I really wanted to, but it's usually just all up here. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So how do you teach, for example, your dad, like the bass part, or does he just kind of... Oh, he up? just does it. He'll just do it. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah, I think he's just so high level that I'm like, okay, we're um, we're in D minor. He's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that, it's that easy with him. But I'm, but if he wasn't that high level, then I would have to explain it. Right, and just okay. kind of say, oh, okay, we're going to do this here there. So I'm, it's kind of, I've been just very fortunate to have, uh, you know, my dad, who's an excellent support, but also like a killer musician as well. Yeah, yeah. And who else have you played with? I feel like you've played with a couple of people. Like you've done some good uh, collabs and stuff, right? Uh, yeah, so um, we're going to do the thing with Brittany tonight. I play, you know, Kalei Gamiao. On, a, on Oahu. Sure. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, great ukulele player. They're from the ukulele site. I don't know if you've uh, seen the, their channel and stuff like that. I probably I've seen it, but I'm not good with the names sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jake. Um, yeah, a lot of the guys in the ukulele community uh, yeah. have got the chance to play with. Especially at like NAM, you know, when you see everybody. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you weren't there this year, were you at NAM? No, I didn't go this no, year. Okay. Yeah, did you go? Yeah, yeah, but it was a lot smaller than normal. Yeah. Um, yeah, people were saying. Yeah, like they haven't opened up the whole of the uh, the convention center. Right. Like there was right. no, I don't think there was anything downstairs, you know, the underground bit. Uh, that was just completely closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, a lot smaller than, than normal, actually. But I guess it'll it'll come back. You Next know, so. April or something. Yeah, 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 I assume so. I don't know, but yeah. 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 Do you enjoy doing like the conventions and stuff? Or? Yeah, I think just by day three, you're just so tired already. But day one, I think that's for us. It's more like a reunion. <laughs> yeah, right. That's <laughs> what I was pretty, this that's, year. I was just kind of enjoying like chatting with people and stuff. Yeah, that, that's the best part. Yeah. I think. Of course, you know, you go to there and then, you know meet some people, try some new ukes. But it's probably um, probably the reunion factor that I, I enjoy the most. But yeah, if you go like. It, it it can get fatiguing in a way because you're there from like what nine trying to get parking to yeah. like five yeah and when you do that like three days in a row it's just like the, by Sunday you're just like oh, I'm just gonna go to Disneyland you know I'm right like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to really go with it yeah. anymore but I don't know if you have like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something but like I find I have get like about fifteen thousand steps oh wow. every day at Nam because you're just <laughs> walking everywhere you know yeah yeah no so. it's uh, it's good and then yeah you're always on your feet there's like only some of the booths have chairs. Yeah. So if you want to break, either go to the place. I think there's like a restaurant, like a food court upstairs, right? The, where the beer garden is. But other than that, yeah, you gotta sit on like a rare bench or something. But for the most part, you're standing. Like yeah, your feet yeah, and it's, yeah. It can get tiring. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so what I was gonna ask you as well. Oh yeah. So in your new album, and maybe some of your other albums as well. But there's like uh, 
synths and pianos and guitars and stuff as well. Yeah. So do you have like a band that you play with or is, is it you and your dad playing at all They're, between you? Yeah, so those guys are actually my, part of my dad's band. Oh, really? Okay. So like Jerry Kowarski, he did all the synth stuff. I was just, you know, I was really blown away what he does because when I hear him play with my dad, it's all like jazz piano stuff. But the guy is just a wizard yeah. in there. And I was like, whoa, like this is what, you know, my heart will go on sounds like. And yeah, the all, Titanic. All the, yeah, thing, Titanic. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he did such a good job. The the drummer, it's funny, I've known him since I was in second grade, so it's just cool to see my dad's friends. And then now they're like my, the people who are on my CD, so we go way back, but it's just, it's really cool to see him, not from like, hey, uncle, to like, oh, okay, we're gonna play, we're gonna put a track down tonight. And um, yeah, it's, they're, gr they're great musicians and good people. And are you recording anything again uh, soon? Have you got any plans to record again? Um, yeah, I might do some, maybe I'll do a single or maybe yeah, and do something solo. Um, but I definitely have something, uh, something coming out soon. Awesome. I'll look forward to that. And what about touring and stuff? Have you got uh, tours going on and stuff now? Or um, Yeah, so pretty much for the rest of the year, it's going to be this California tour. And then uh, we're going up to Washington. But next year, I told you You're earlier that I'm going to I'll be coming to the UK. So coming to the UK, amazing. I'm, look, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah. Like the energy there is, is just next level. Because I've been to many places, but the, the UK energy is one of my favorites. Is that for... Oh wait, can can you say what you're doing there yet? Or it's it's pretty much, it's gonna be a tour. Okay. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. Like all over the country. Um, yeah, we're trying to we're, we should um, we're trying to get that done early as possible. Yeah. So we already made some contacts, but hopefully we can put a nice full tour together. Maybe go off to one of the European countries as well. That'd be amazing. Well, give me a shout if you come to uh, well when you come to England. Let me know. Will do, you man. Know, if you're near my place or whatever, near enough, I'll come and see you you know if i can that'd yeah be, no that'd, that'd be cool man and, uh, okay well let's wrap it up i guess what um how can people follow you are you big on social media at all or? yeah you can find me on instagram andrew molina uke i have a youtube channel as well facebook just type in andrew molina or yeah. you can go to my website andrew molina ukulele.com where i have some uh, new merch out and stuff like that so cool 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 um oh and was there anything you wanted to talk about or mention that i haven't kind of got into yet at all or uh, I mean, yeah, look out early 2020, 2023 for a, a, a cool no ukulele program that I'll be offering. With your academy? With my academy. Excellent. Okay, yeah. cool. We will do for sure. Okay. Um, in that case, Andrew, thanks so much, man. It's been really cool talking to you. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Yeah, Cheers. I had a blast. Okay. And I was talking with Andrew a little bit about just what's coming up in his academy in a couple of months' time after we stop recording. And it sounds absolutely tremendous. He's got a really great idea, and I think people are going to find it a lot of fun. I am sworn to secrecy for the time being, but as soon as it's revealed, I'm sure I'll be talking a little bit more about it right here on the podcast. And talking of Nam, I have just this week booked my flight for April. Are you going... Would you like to go? Do you even know what it is? I don't think I'll have time to be trotting off to Disneyland this year like Andrew did, but I am looking forward to pounding the floors of the Anaheim Convention Center once again and hopefully getting some more great interviews with people. If you're a ukulele player or someone in the world of ukulele and you're off to Nam, drop me a line and perhaps I could be interviewing you for the show. Who knows? Anyway, I had a great time chatting with Andrew, and I hope you enjoyed listening to him. Lots of insights for such a young musician, and I definitely learned a thing or two from this one. Next week, we'll have some more great ukulele chat from another top name, and I can't wait to speak to you all again. Don't forget, if you are enjoying the show and you'd like me to keep making it, one of the top ways you can help support it is just by telling people about it. If you have a little ukulele community that you're a part of, maybe online or Facebook or a forum or something, or even in the real world, out there in the real big wide world. If you enjoy listening to the show, then the chances are that some of your ukulele community might enjoy listening to it too. So please spread the word about Ukulele Tales. It's a free podcast. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else people get their podcasts from. So it really is easy to find. And not many people know but you can also watch it on YouTube too. So if that's something you prefer doing, then we are here, hello, right here on YouTube. Normally every Wednesday or Thursday, it gets posted shortly after it's come out on all the other audio streaming services. Anyway, I've been the ukulele teacher. Do I still need to say that on here? Let's stick to my real name maybe. I've been John Atkins. 
This is Ukulele Tales, and until next time, I love you all, and I wish you the best.